Exercise seems to reduce the excitability of the sympathetic nervous system. So if there's less sympathetic excitability, the blood pressure will also tend to be uh, lower. Exercise will also increase insulin uh, sensitivity. A certain amount of insulin will have a greater hypoglycemic effect, probably due to the sensitization or the increase in numbers of, of insulin receptors. And if there's less insulin in the blood, there seems to be less stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system uh, as well. As well as that, if someone takes plenty of exercise and are physically fit, then they can increase the amount of oxygen they're able to absorb from the capillary blood. That means a given volume of blood can carry more oxygen to the tissues. And it is the metabolic demand of the tissue that controls the perfusion of blood through that tissue, the local blood supply. So if a given volume of blood is giving a lot of oxygen to the tissues, as it will in a fit person, then you need a less, a lowered flow of blood through that tissue. If this is true all over the body, then the heart doesn't need to work as hard to generate the blood pressure to perfuse the tissues of the body. That seemed to make sense to me when I said it. Um, these ideas are a little speculative, but what we know for sure is that physical exercise can help to lower raised blood pressure. So ask your patients about these lifestyle factors. Where necessary, get the patient to change their lifestyle and you can lower their blood pressure and therefore lower all the complications that are associated with hypertension. What I'd like to do now is go on and consider the pathophysiology. What abnormal physiological processes are there associated with hypertension. But just before we do that, I just want to go back to the last point a minute because it is an important one. Exercise. The exercise we're talking about is aerobic. So it's not quick sprints and it's not doing lots of weights. It's things like walking, cycling, swimming as the patient gets fit, maybe jogging. An exercise, remember, <clears throat> should raise the heart rate sometimes cause sweating, and ideally uh, last for half an hour a day. So the patient needs to try and build these kind of changes into their lifestyle. Pathophysiology, what is it that's going wrong in hypertension? And now we're considering the essential form of hypertension, primary hypertension. So let's think about the pathophysiology. What is, what is going wrong here? Well, this is a little speculative, in my understanding at least, but there seems to be sympathetic overactivity initially. For some reason, for a period of, t for a period of time, there's overactivity of the sympathetic nervous system. And one of the effects of this is that you get an increased cardiac output. And it is known that early on in the development of essential hypertension, there is an increased cardiac output, even although in the early stages, the peripheral resistance and the peripheral vessels are normal. So we do know there is an increase in cardiac output in the initial stages of the disease. We assume this is due to a sympathetic overactivity. Quite why there's a sympathetic overactivity, uh, I'm not so sure about. But there's an increased cardiac output. Now, if you increase cardiac output over a period of time, in fact, if you increase cardiac output at all, you'll get an increased blood pressure. Blood pressure equals cardiac output times peripheral resistance in the presence of adequate venous return. So you get an increased cardiac output. Therefore, you get an, acute, an acutely increased blood pressure, if you like. Blood pressure goes up in the short term. Now, over weeks or months, this will result in some vascular changes. So the increased blood pressure will actually start to adversely affect the peripheral blood vessels in ways we'll look at shortly. 
But the end result of these vascular changes is that you get an increased peripheral resistance. And we know that increased peripheral resistance will increase blood pressure. Now we know that later on in the disease process of essential hypertension, the cardiac output is actually normal, but the peripheral resistance is increased. And we are presuming this is due to vascular changes and damage caused by the increased cardiac output. So the increased peripheral resistance leads to increased blood pressure and this appears to be a long-term effect. So you get an increased blood pressure over a period of time. And it seems that the baroreceptors must be involved in this as well, because normally if you had an increased blood pressure, you would get an increased number of nerve impulses going from the baroreceptors to inhibit the sympathetic outflow from the vasomotor center. And this does not seem to happen. So the baroreceptors appear to lose their sensitivity to the increase in blood pressure. Now, hypertension accelerates the process of atherosclerosis. In other words, it results in increased rates of deposition of atheroma in the arterial lumens, especially affecting the larger arteries. We've dealt with this in detail on other videos like number 13 on ischemic heart disease, for example. But for now, let's just remember that the atheroma clogs up the arterial lumen. This has three effects. It causes distal ischemia. The blood turbulence can result in thrombosis and infarction. And the weakening of the arterial wall can lead to aneurysm. So the process of atheroma can lead to any condition caused by ischemia, thrombosis or aneurysm. A very wide spectrum of pathology indeed. So <clears throat> increasing rates of atheroma. Now, if the blood pressure is high for a long period of time, that's pushing on the walls of the blood vessels, of, of, of the arterial vessels. And the vessels result in this with a hypertrophy. The cells will grow in size. And in some tissues, there may be a hyperplasia as well, a growth in the number of cells. Now this affects the tunica intima, the inside layer, so you get intimal thickening. It also affects the middle layer of the arterial vessels, the tunica media, so you also get medial thickening. Smooth muscle, connective tissues are affected, and hypertrophy. So the hypertension leads on to hypertrophy, of arterial walls. These effects are also going to reduce the lumen because the vessels are swollen, the lumen of the arter arterial vessels can become narrowed. In addition to that, the pressure results in the deposition of collagen. Do you remember collagen is a, is a protein? Deposition of collagen and these get forced into the walls of the vessels. Now collagen is, is very good for tensile strength. It is remarkably strong, but it is not elastic. It's essentially scar tissue. Scar tissue with fibrous tissue is mostly collagen. So you get deposition of collagen, essentially scar tissue, in the walls of the arterial vessels, causing a lot lo loss of elasticity. The vessels become more rigid. The high pressure also causes, forces fibr fibrinogen into the arterial walls. Fibrinogen, you might remember, is a clotting protein. It causes blood clotting because it's converted to fibrin. 
So the fibrinogen can result